Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. All glory, honor, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray during our discussion, I may be filled with the Holy Spirit, and I may interpret Scripture interpretly, and you as well may be filled with the Holy Spirit to take into your heart any truth that I speak and any Scripture that I interpret correctly, anything I speak that's not true, or any Scripture I interpret incorrectly, which is obviously not intentional, I pray this is not welcomed into your heart or mind. Today's video will be another in the New Testament Treasures playlist of this YouTube channel, and as you can see, it's entitled, Touch Me Not. We'll begin in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 11 through 14. But Mary Magdalene stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Verses 15-18 through 18. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Continuing, verses 19 through 21. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were, were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so I send you. Verses 22 through 25. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Notice Christ when he breathed the Holy Spirit on them, and he talked about them remitting and retaining sins. He used the present tense. Let's compare that to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Future tense. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Future tense. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Future tense. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Future tense. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Verily say, I say unto you, speaking to the disciples in the early church, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Again, future tense. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Future tense. Notice how the Gospels are interconnected. In Matthew, these promises are in the future, and in John, they're being fulfilled after his resurrection, when he states the same things, but now in the present tense. Let's go back to the Gospel of John. Verses 26 to 29, chapter 20 again. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. There's a beautiful Orthodox icon of this scene. If you compare that, by the way, to the initial icon on the uh, uh, title screen of 
Jesus and Mary Magdalene. You'll see it's a very similar depiction, although now Christ is asking, and this icon uh, visually asking uh, Thomas to touch him, whereas before he was kind of pushing off Mary Magdalene not to touch him. So the question's for you. Number one, why did Jesus tell Mary Magdalene not to touch him? What's the answer to that question? Because here, why did Jesus later request that Thomas Didymus touch him? We'll get to that answer. Did you notice there were three references to peace, peace be unto you. So what might these repeated references to peace mean? Now, what I've heard in the past to explain this is that the reason Christ told Mary Magdalene not to touch him was because you know she was gonna to cling to him and he knew what she really needed and that's why he told her not to touch him because she wouldn't let go. Whereas on the contrary, Thomas Didymus, Christ needed him to touch him to believe. So is that what it is, or is there a lot more to it? Let's go to Genesis. This is starting with the concept of peace. What did Christ mean? The three references. Do you think that's coincidental? He said three times, peace be unto you, peace be unto you, peace be unto you. Genesis 49, verse 10. This is when Israel is blessing his children, and he gets to Judah, his fourth son. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Of course, the scepter is something you hold in your hand. It's a, a sh a showing the rulership of a king nor a lawgiver. Now, usually I like the King James rendering, but you'll see the Hebrew actually reads the ruler's staff. So it, in the King James it says, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, but I think a better translation or better rendering would be the ruler's staff from between his feet. By the way, just look at that. What does that show? Just imagine what that's a picture of. That's a picture of Christ on the cross, right? He's the king. In his hands, he's holding the scepter, which would be the horizontal beam, and between his feet, sticking into Golgotha, into the skull of the serpent, is the beam there, right? Until Shiloh, which means the Messiah, or peace, I'll show you that, come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So notice this beautiful prophecy of the Messiah. And you could show this to any believing Jew friend you might have, because this proves, along with a prophecy in Daniel 9, the timing of the Messiah. Note the Messiah, the Shiloh, has to come before the scepter departs from Judah. When did the scepter finally depart from Judah? When the Jews, uh, uh, Jerusalem and the Judea was finally demolished, destroyed, no stone left on another by the Romans in AD 70. So obviously the Messiah had to come before AD 70, regardless. Again, there's uh, from Bible Hub, you can see in the uh, Hebrew Probably, obviously, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, but Emu Hekek, nor the staff, Miben, from between Raglau, his feet, nor the staff between his feet. But you see at the bottom, Shiloh, right? Shiloh, one time used in this context, Genesis 49 10, referring to the Messiah. But also, we know the, the term Shalom, right? Shalom, peace, prosperity, be happy, be in safety. So Shiloh means peace, peace be unto you, peace be unto you, peace be unto you. It also refers to the Messiah and this beautiful uh, initial prophecy, or in your face prophecy of Christ the Messiah. Gospel of John, let's go back to it. Earlier in the gospel, John 14, verse 27, look at this. Christ speaking to his disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Chapter 16, verses 28 to 31. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Pay attention to this. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus, Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Verses 32 through 36, chapter 16. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Chapter 14, verses 16 through 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you 
and shall be in you. By the way, when he's telling them he dwelleth with you, that's because the Holy Spirit was was within Christ, right? Jesus Christ, after his anointing, his baptism in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, when the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descended as a dove to rest upon him and remain with him, and he had it in its fullness. So when he tells him that the Comforter dwells with you, he's dwelling within Christ at that time. But later, he shall be in the disciples. And we saw that when Jesus Christ breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Chapter 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I, got no, for, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. Pay attention to this. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So notice, for them to get the Holy Spirit, Christ has to depart. So does this just mean his death and resurrection, or might there be more to it? Since we're talking about the, the Holy Spirit here, let's go back and see some interesting things. Let's go look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is John the Baptist speaking. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, the baptism of John. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And we saw that happening in John chapter 20, and with fire. Mark 1 verse 8, speaking of the same event, John the Baptist again speaking, I indeed have baptized you with water, water unto repentance, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. We saw that in John 20, no reference to fire here. Luke chapter 3 verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, again John chapter 20, and with fire. What's that? John chapter 1 verse 33, again John the Baptist speaking, and I knew him not, but he that set me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost, which is fulfilled in John chapter 20. So let's look at this. Notice Jesus baptizes with the Holy Ghost and we'll see with fire. But as you'll see here in John chapter 4 verses 1 through 2, he didn't baptize with water, not himself. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized with water, not but his disciples. So Jesus didn't baptize with water unto repentance. John the Baptist did, and then Jesus' disciples did. Jesus later baptized with the Holy Ghost, which we saw in John chapter 20. How about the fire? Luke 24, 49, this is the resurrected Christ speaking. And behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tear ye in the city of Jerusalem, don't leave, until ye be imbued with power from on high. So they're going to get power. This is after they've received the Holy Ghost. They're later going to get power. Well, we know what that is. That's Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them the baptism of fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Ah, so the baptism of the Holy Ghost was to their salvation. They received the Holy Spirit within themselves. And later, all believers have this, including hopefully myself and yourselves, right? We pray this. We believe this. Um, and, and when you feel, hopefully you're feeling this even when we, we read these verses of God, when you feel that, I feel that it's kind of a bubbling up from the core of my being up to my shoulders, up to the back of my neck, that kind of makes us know that we do have the Holy Spirit within us. But then the baptism of fire is when they get these prophetic powers, speaking in tongues, etc., which I myself don't have, and I doubt most of you doubt most of you have. What do I know? But I doubt it. Acts chapter two, verse thirty-three. This is Peter later speaking to the Jews. Therefore, about Christ. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this. He shed forth the Holy Ghost, which ye now see and hear. They saw the power of it. There is an example of Pentecost. It's interesting. 
you'll see the, the tongues of fire descending. It, to the left, kind of at the top there, there is it's supposed to be Peter, and to the right, kind of the balding individual with the, you know, Peter has the white hair, and the, to the right, the balding individual with the kind of brown hair, that's St. Paul. Now, St. Paul obviously was not here at this time, but out of respect, they include him in the iconography. Below, you see that, that image in the darkness, that's cosmos, the world. So they're going to go out to the world and spread the gospel, empow empowered with the Holy Ghost at Pentecost here, with their baptism with fire. So final questions. Let's go back to what we talked about earlier. Why did Jesus tell Mary Magdalene not to touch him? He had not yet risen to the Father. Remember? I, I need to tell, my, tell, tell your brethren, I'm going to my Father and your God, and, 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 my, and my God and your God and your Father, etc. So he had not yet risen to the Father. After this, he would return and baptize his true believers with the Holy, Go Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Until this time, most likely no one could physically touch his glorified body. Understand at that point, and now, Jesus Christ's glorified body is the most amazing thing in all creation. Remember, only certain individuals could touch the um, Ark of the Covenant. The glorified body of Jesus Christ is infinitely greater in its holiness and power than the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and sometimes would die in there if they didn't do the right thing. Well, guess what? The glorified body of Jesus Christ is infinitely greater than the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or in the Temple of Jerusalem, Temple of Solomon, Temple of Herod. So that's why I believe he told her not to touch him, having nothing to do with, oh, she's going to be clingy. She probably would have been destroyed because she had not yet received the spirit. And the reason that she had not yet received the spirit, Christ had been resurrected, but he had to go to his father like he told her. Why did Jesus later request that Thomas Didymus touch him? He had returned from the father. He thus could be touched by true believers. He had baptized, and then he, he had baptized, remember, eight days earlier, his true believers with the Holy Spirit. So not just the disciples present received the Holy Spirit. Everyone, every true believer, including Todd, Thomas Didymus, received the Holy Spirit. And thus, it appears, true believers can now physically touch his glorified body. Guess what? We, as true believers, will be able to touch his glorified body. A non-true believer, probably like touching the Ark of Coven the Covenant or walking to the Holy of Holies, would be destroyed what might the repeated references to peace mean? Peace be unto you, peace be unto you, peace be, you, be unto you, I will bring you peace, etc. Jesus was declaring his victory as the Christ, as the divine King Messiah promised back in Genesis 49, Israel to Judah. In Jesus, all true believers will be gathered to find peace and rest due to his finished work on the cross. Amen. Well, I enjoyed that discussion. Hopefully you did as well. Again, I pray. I spoke in truth. Truth comes from God. I pray interpret things correctly. I did my best to interpret it correctly. If I said anything that's false, again, it's my error. If I interpreted anything correctly, it's incorrectly, it's my error, and forgive me. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Hopefully that was a blessing to you. I pray, Lord willing, we shall meet again, and God bless you all.